Okay, let's get started. I think that, uh, you know, considering that school is out, um, it's probably going to be, some people are probably going to be trickling in late, um, trying to get uh, daycare for their children and stuff like that. So, um, uh, anyway, before we get started, um, I have uh, three announcements to make. Um, Roberto Boldi has won um, a meritorious award, and I'm like totally embarrassed right now because I've forgotten who it's from, but it's a big deal. Um, and um, um, Laurel Brown, also from cardiology, has been uh, chosen to be uh, the speaker for um, the graduating class of the medical school here. And then last but not least, uh, Courtney Schott. Uh, from dermatology has received a commendation from the ACGME uh, for her contributions um, to the training program director summit. So, you know, I think we should all be proud that uh, we have uh, faculty members who are uh, making their mark um, on the national scene. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to introduce um, our speaker today, Dr. Matthias Pressler um, from the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Kretzler did all of his training, uh, well, not all of his training. He did his undergraduate medical training um, in the States, uh, but then did training in uh, Germany and actually was at the University of Munich um, um, after his nephrology fellowship as an attending physician uh, there. Uh, he was recruited to the University of Michigan um, um, in 2005 and has been there since that time. Um, he is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine in the Nephrology Division. Um, he uh, also is in computational research um, and there's one other position that I've forgotten what it is, but he has that one, you know, as well. Basically the bottom line being is that uh, this is an individual who has an interest in, um, in multidisciplinary type of research, um, which is part of what he's going to uh, talk about today. His major clinical interest has been in glomerular diseases um, of the kidneys and um, identifying new ways of classifying them um, and new ways of finding therapeutic targets. And with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Kretzler. No, no, uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Good morning, everybody, and really appreciate it. You managed to get here and get your kids sorted for 8 o'clock. Uh, so what I would like to do over the next 45 minutes or so is to give you an introduction in the approach uh, we are trying to pursue in nephrology to uh, develop uh, novel innovative therapies uh, for our patients going forward. And the philosophy here is and uh, that we are taking patients which we are following uh, for routine clinical care in our uh, unit and try to capture as comprehensive information from these patients, ranging from a deep clinical analysis of their state and how that state changes over time up to uh, the genetics and genomics information, uh, including uh, the proteome where your center obviously is one of the leading collaborators we are looking forward to work uh, together with uh, for several uh, years to come. And then the key part is we are trying then to learn how these different elements and aspects, uh, the way the disease presents, are talking to each other to define cross-cutting disease mechanisms. And this cross-cutting disease mechanism, we feel strongly, will allow us to predict better where the disease journey will take our patients going forward, meaning which patients with kidney disease will progress to end organ failure, which will do just fine. And then in parallel, uh, we hope to identify in the different individuals specific disease mechanisms who are driving the disease process forward in those individuals, where then we can develop, deliver targeted therapy. The exciting part is that I think in each of these elements, I can show you first indication that that strategy actually really is working, and we are starting to deliver both novel diagnostic and therapeutic concepts to our patients. Why is this needed? And this is a slide for the non-nephrologist in the room. It's needed because uh, kidney disease is rampant, and particularly uh, 
you can hear somebody treating uh, people in the Midwest, in the Midwest with uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, extremes we are finding in our clinic. But particularly patients of uh, minority descent have an excessive burden of the disease. Overall, 10% of our population has some sort of chronic kidney disease. Half a million of those are on active renal replacement. Diabetes is nearly causing half of those Procrastive end stage renal severe disease. And so, five year survival rate if you are diabetic and you are on end stage renal disease uh, dialysis is dismal. It's a third. Uh, and uh, we do expect that that rate will grow due to the obesity and diabetes epidemic. The costs to our healthcare system are staggering. So, actually, 1.2% of the total federal budget, not the healthcare budget, the total federal budget goes just to give dialysis to uh, our people here. And similar incidents are present in Europe. Actually, the scary part is we have a sister uh, unit in China and just published in the New England Journal the last year that now in China, the uh, CKD epidemic is driven there by diabetes as well in the metropolitan area. So it's a truly global uh, problem and uh, has the ability to really break our healthcare delivery system. If we do not find novel entry points to prevent and identify kidney disease risks in our patients. My wife is a radiation oncologist, so we always have a discussion in our family who our patients are sicker. And uh, really, the uh, community does not appreciate how quickly our patients die on uh, dialysis. Here you can see, according to diagnosis, uh, that we quickly have after. <coughs> Uh, uh, five year, only a third of our patients alive. Only transplantation does it uh, differently. But otherwise, irrespective of uh, treatment options, our patients do exceptionally poorly. And one can state, except maybe for those patients with primary glomerular disease, certainly for diabetic kidney disease, that dialysis is more palliation than treatment. So we have to change that. The way I think. Uh, the community feels we can change it by identifying what actually is happening in mechanistic terms inside our patient's kidney so that we can target selectively uh, the disease process. Because the treatments we are giving in our clinic right now, quite often, or in the majority of the cases, are non specific and have actually been incidental findings uh, which we transferred from other disease specialties. So to develop kidney-specific therapies, we implemented now uh, over uh, 16 years ago a strategy where we take advantage of the fact that we nephrologists do take kidney tissue out, percutaneous needle biopsies from our patients for diagnostic purposes. But with modification in the procedure and the advancing biometrical technologies, we can use the same tissue for molecular analysis of the disease process. And then if we capture the clinical disease scores, we can link molecular disease process in the glomerular filter or the tubal interstitial compartment after microdissection with the disease scores over time. We have an added advantage that in kidney disease, the urine provides uh, what one can refer to as a liquid biopsy. I mean, in the urine, we find cells, we find proteins uh, who are derived from the kidney, and if done, properly allow us in a dynamic manner to complement the snapshot of the disease process. The biopsy always has to be with a more dynamic monitoring uh, urine and in some instances plasma allows one to. This, this protocol established actually initially out of an EU funded network in, in Europe, now implemented actually at multiple centers and networks who are all governed but are using the same procurement protocol and data acquisition strategy. So that what we find in the US can be quickly replicated in other socioeconomic and genetic backgrounds and see which of these processes are cutting across and which ones are disease stage, a disease type, or environmental. For this, we started initially in 1999 with the Pan European Network funded by the European Union, who has accumulated now. Uh, nearly 3,000 renal biopsies. They are process quality controlled, and you will see that they are one of our main backbones for many of our analyses. In 2005, when uh, our group came to Michigan, we started a similar effort 
in the Midwest where we have now 1,500 CKD patients profiled. In 2009, we got funding from NCATS, the NIH Office of Rare Disease, to establish a rare disease network focused on FSGS minimal change and membranous, where we have very deeply phenotyped these patients and have developed a flurry of uh, studies around core cohorts to identify the mechanisms in these orphan diseases. So significantly higher penetrance, you have robust effect sizes, it's a great discovery tool. We are looking forward to exciting proteomic projects with Mike Merchant and John Klein, which we are just uh, starting to embark on together. We also take advantage of the unique population. The NIDDK has a long-standing commitment to research studies in the Native American population, the Pima Indian, and with Rob Nelson, we've been working for 20 years now in this population, including studies where we have patients their parents, their children profiled and followed now for 40 years with multiple sampling, including multiple uh, protocol biopsies. And recently, we initiated a collaboration with uh, the HC Africa effort from the Wellcome Trust and NIH, where with the leadership from Dr. Ocho and Dr. Adu, uh, we have now over 8,000 patients recruited in Africa in the case control studies. They are currently undergoing comprehensive phenotyping and the biopsy study is ongoing where uh, for the very first time we learn how kidney diseases present in sub-Saharan Africa in a very unique environmental and most of all genetic background, which we expect will teach us a lot, not only how patients in Africa are suffering from their disease, but also in principle terms, how genetic diversity is impacting the disease process. And the NIDDK has started a systematic effort to wrap these type of strategies together with the uh, precision medicine uh, studies, the KPMP, uh, with uh, Jonathan Himmelfarb, Bravi Iengard, and myself are leading uh, as a data coordinating center. So lots of activities ongoing. All of these activities have a robust ancillary study system linked to it. And I think one of the main uh, hope, expectation is that over the next couple of days, I can bring these projects closer to you and identify research opportunities for you working with these studies where a lot of uh, uh, time and energy has been invested. And I, I always joke with junior faculty that we spend the better part of our professional life to generate now opportunities which we can serve junior faculties on a silver plate to pick what menus items they would like to use for their scientific career ahead of them. Very exciting time in kidney disease because we have now these multiple areas of knowledge established from our diseases in many different environments so that we can start to see how can we link these different areas together to identify uh, the key drivers of the disease. Or conversely, if you are interested in a specific molecule, a specific pathway, a specific disease state, you don't have to spend 20 years to establish a cohort to establish bioassembles, to establish outcomes. Those are available here. They have been established so that we can help you with your research project in this context. So please reach out to us if any of what you hear over the next 45 minutes or adrenal rounds tomorrow appeals to you in, in your own research interest. So what we are doing right now is to drive this forward to really Im start to impact the life of our patients is that we have assembled these comprehensive profiles in various ways for the research community to interact with from the clinical, morphological, and molecular information. And then we are pursuing kind of uh, these four main areas. One is, can we identify who will respond to a standard of care and who will progress with the disease process and who will just do fine? And the nephrology clinic, at least, uh, quite often than not, I have to tell my patients that I don't know, that we will have just to watch and see how the disease develops. So enhancing our ability to predict disease progression is critical. And then obviously we finally see a fair amount of clinical trial activity starting in uh, kidney disease. There are two main areas. One is, can we identify which patient would benefit best from which treatment? so that we recruit patients into a trial who are most likely to re respond to treatment option A into trial A, and those more likely to respond to treatment option B in trial B. And I will give a detailed description of our strategy tomorrow at Renal Round. 
And then uh, I will give one example today how we can even develop a target engagement biomarkers, meaning a way to profile early in a patient if a, the individual is exposed to a treatment, if we actually do see a response to the treatment so that patients don't have to wait uh, for a few years to see if a therapy is effective. And then obviously we have an ongoing activity, use all that information to A, repurpose drugs who are effective for other diseases into kidney, particularly the rare glomerular diseases, and uh, to identify the novel drug development opportunities. So let's get started. One of the strategies which we used early and designed our study carefully to allow to do that is, can we do risk prediction? Can we uh, use our outcomes, which we uh, accumulate in a prospective cohort over time, to actually then ask in our baseline sampling, which we have done on the same individuals, are there specific events, specific uh, observations which can predict who will do great, meaning the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate is stable and proteinuria goes in remission versus those who do poorly. And the way we are setting these studies up is pretty standard in the field that you do initially a training cohort study where we identify, and identify candidate biomarkers and then we flip over in a test cohort and this is initially a cohort from the same study population which was hauled out from the initial study and then flipping over in independent studies, independent cohorts. And that really is critical. If you're planning any of these type of work early on, consider how can I generate my uh, data acquisition, my clinical uh, cohort design, so that I can have effective replication in independent cohorts. So the specific strategy I will show uh, today is one where we actually stole an idea from our colleagues in oncology that they very quickly identify that trying to identify biomarkers of cancer progression using blood or uh, other biofluids as a discovery tool didn't work very well. But if they identified in the diseased organ the biomarker of disease state or progression, then that is started to allow them to get tissue level uh, candidate biomarkers identified. And then we can flip those over and ask if these indeed are robust biomarkers of the disease state, can we identify them in a biofluid for pathologist that usually is urine, so that we can actually access large cohorts of patients' populations to see if our outcome predictions work. And this is what we did here. We used initially the European cohort and then replicated on tissue level in the North American cohort. Uh, biomarkers predict uh, the uh, degree of renal impairment here, uh, the estimated glomerular filtration rate using a machine learning approach called rich regression modeling, where out of 12,000 biomarkers candidates, gene expression levels obtained from renal biopsy specimens, we identify those six to allow the robust prediction that's already the replication cohort of the degree of renal impairment. That's a good starting point. Have tissue level transcriptional biomarkers who is doing poorly or not. We then evaluated if we want to flip over to the non-invasive state of the profiling, which of these molecules are a good candidate. There, uh, we specifically evaluated which of these molecules are actually expressed in a tissue-specific manner and have the ability to regulate a lot of the downstream molecules also found to be associated. And we honed in on epidermal growth factor for several reasons. Our software uh, analysis tools showed us that that's one of the key upstream regulators of many of other molecules who have been associated with loss of kidney function over time on the tissue level with the renal transcript, the mRNA expression profiling we did. And most importantly, the molecule which is highly kidney specific. Using public sources, we could identify that indeed it is only expressed in the kidney from all other organs measured. In our own databases, we could show that it's highly selective in the tubular compartment versus the glomerular compartment. Using single cell uh, RNA profiling, which we have been pursuing in the interim, we could show that in isolated cells from the kidney, which we sequence individually, it indeed is in the distal tubal loop of Henley expressed and not much else. And then doing in situ hybridization, we could confirm 
that the molecule indeed is found in statistic pupils depicted here in healthy kidney. And if you are in chronic kidney disease, the molecule is lost. So mica of differentiated distal tubular function. We then set out, as I mentioned, can we transition from the kidney to the urine? So we asked in our cohorts, this is the CKD cohort, this is the rare glomerular disease cohort, in patients where we had both two mRNA levels and urine available, does tissue and urine correlate? You can see in the CKD cohort across many different diseases captured in that cohort, it does correlate. And even in the rare disease cohort where patients had 5, 10, 15 grams of proteinuria, this specific protein still correlated in its urine concentrations very tightly and closely to the tissue. So we can conclude that the urinary biomarker indeed is reflective of the state of the tissue around this specific molecule. Remember, it's a key upstream regulator, so it could be a representation of a comprehensive state of the organ and not just a single molecule. And then we flipped over, now significantly larger sample sizes, and studied our urine samples from our cohort that would show, yes, the relationship between EGF, now measured in the urine, normalized for urine creatinine, continue to correlate closely with the measured GFR. We then took advantage of the features of the cohort studies that we capture a lot of parallel information. And in the rare disease Neptune study, we actually do digitalize all of the biopsy slides and have pathologists to score those for a variety of parameters. So one of the key parameters our pathology scores is the of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. Two parameters where if there's a nephropathologist in the room, he will tell you these are our strongest outcome predictors out of a kidney biopsy. We could show that our urinary CF concentration correlated tightly with interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, meaning if the tissue damage goes up, this mic of tubular differentiation in the urine disappears, giving us an indication that for the very first time we might have a non-invasive surrogate of the degree of uh, structural tissue damage present in the tissue. So armed with that information, we then set out to ask the key question, can we associate the urinary observations with the disease progression and use two different strategies? One is that uh, we ask, can we predict the percent loss of glomerular filtration rate over time? In our cohort, we measure GFR on a four monthly base. And uh, over time, we can see what is the percent loss of GFR in our cohort perspective. And if we do that and ask to what extent can albuminuria, our best outcome predictor, uh, predict the loss of GFR over time, then you can see, yes, albuminuria can do it, but does a pretty poorly job, as sadly we know from our clinical routine. Urinary EGF, however, uh, shows a significantly stringent correlation with the loss of uh, GFR over time if uh, related in a predictive model. And then finally, we uh, took to our global research networks where we measured urinary EGF in the CKD cohort in North America, in the rare disease cohort in Neptune, and in the IGA uh, sister cohort network out of Beijing. And in the multivariable adjusted model, where we adjusted for all of our best outcome predictors we have available, our uh, biomarker in the urine EGF actually had significant additive value to predict progression of kidney disease in these patients. Arguing that adding a, comp a tubular compartment reflecting these key functional features of the kidney to our current assessment of kidney function, which primarily is hemodynamic and glomerular function, indeed can make a difference. And uh, this was not only uh, accepted by the journals, but also Francis Collins, the NIH director, uh, blocked on it to stating that this actually is one way how precision medicine can work in multinational disease networks. And we have been uh, very excited to see that our finding has been replicated now in many different scenarios. Uh, European study, the Summit IMI network, uh, with a parallel independent approach coming from animal models primarily, ended up with the same molecule could show that it is an outcome predictor in diabetic kidney disease. And we are aware of 19 cohorts with more than 25,000 individuals. 
where EGF has or is being measured right now and showing that it is indeed a very robust progression predictor both in the general population and in distinct individual renal rare diseases. So this was one strategy where I hope to introduce to you the concept how combining different approaches and strategies can allow you to hone in on one of those few key molecules who indeed might stand the test of time as novel diagnostic biome. The next stage obviously is if we can identify a patient at risk of progression of disease, can we do something about it? And here, use a different strategy. Here we use actually the opportunity to measure our patient states and then ask which molecular pathways are identified, are these pathways associated with outcome, and can they be targeted for treatment intervention? This is a study here which I will use as an example, which we have uh, worked very closely with Rob Nelson, who has studied the Pima Indian population in the Southwest now for 30 years. This is a population with an excessively high burden of diabetes and early manifestations of diabetic end organ complication particularly diabetic kidney disease. Really a devastating disease uh, for these people. In each family, usually several members are on dialysis or have been lost with kidney disease already. They are highly motivated to participate in research studies. And Rob Nelson has done a renal protection and early diabetic nephropathy trial a couple of decades back, where the <coughs> hypothesis was PAN and uh, losartan RAS inhibition result in for protection for progressive kidney disease. And as part of the study, patients were biopsied at the end of the trial, and we obtained material from these biopsies for molecular profiling similar to what I have just shown you for the ASA core. This was an exceptionally informative study. These are patients with diabetes, where Rob knows exactly the onset of diabetes. So they were biopsied uh, 10 to 12 years after uh, in uh, development of di diabetes. And these have mainly not manifested in clinical terms diabetic kidney disease. They have normal GFRs or hyperfiltrating. They have no albuminuria. So if they would be seen in your general medicine clinic, you would not refer them to a nephrologist and you would not talk about kidney disease yet. However, if you look in their kidney biopsies, you can see that actually a third of the kidney already is scarred up that we have significant tubular interstitial fibrosis, inflammation, and glomerular sclerosis. This A is an indication about the functional reserves the kidney has, but also a clear warning sign for all of us how much tissue damage is present before we even recognize it. Again, a need to establish biomarkers to detect these disease processes earlier than we are doing. So what we did is we tried to understand what's happening in these kidneys where we don't know that they are damaged. So we did similar strategies as shown before. We generated gene expression profiles. We measured the parameters in the biopsies, the degree of interstitial fibrosis, volume of fractional volume of the interstitial area. In the Pima cohort, GFRs are measured invasively by isosolomel clearances and the albumin to creatinine ratios and then ask, can we relate the intrarenal signatures to the degree of structural damage with the functional state in these early kidney disease patients? And if we can identify an association, can we link it back to the underlying molecular mechanism? And doing that, we had to play a special, special strategy here to reduce dimensionality in the data set as these are small cohorts, it's an invasive procedure with significant risk for the patients. So we had 120 biopsies to start with, and in various studies, we usually use between 40 and 80 biopsies. If you do a genome-wide comparison, it has 15,000 parameters in 40 patients, you will die of multiple testing instantaneously. So we reduced our complexity by what we call co-expression modules. Gene expression regulation is highly coordinated. There's a lot of intercorrelation, which you are, can you allow to extract key features in your data set who are jointly regulated. And if we do that, you can see that we can uh, collapse the overall state into 11 main observations of gene sets tightly correlated together. And then we ask how these gene sets are associated with our <coughs> phenotype. And with this approach, we could identify gene sets who are associated with a degree of 
scupula interstitial damage in these patients who are clinically still silent. And then we look what are the underlying molecular concepts who are associated with a degree of preclinical tissue damage. There were two main signatures coming up. One, not surprisingly, in diabetes, as the metabolic signatures, where we can see the response, particularly of the tubular systems, to the hyperglycemia and, and associated oxidative stresses. But interestingly, equally uh, strong was an inflammatory tissue response present, meaning the kidney, who is challenged by the metabolic state, activates an inflammatory mechanism, which is associated with progression of it. And that's something which, at least 10 years ago, when we initiated these studies, was not very well appreciated. So we decided very carefully look into that further. And one of the first things we did, remember, with genome scale studies, replicate, replicate, and replicate, we switched over to our European study, where now we have a very different population. These are patients, they have indication renal biopsy, they have established chronic kidney disease, GFRs between 30 and 100, they have albuminuria. They are Europeans for the European diet, meaning very different environment, uh, very different genetic background. So the question is, is a finding which we had in these very unique North American, Native American populations replicating in the European cohort. And uh, we could indeed show that uh, nearly three quarters of the teens who were associated with early functional damage in the PIMA population were replicating in the European cohort. And all of the major regulatory hubs from CGF beta uh, to NF kappa B to PIPA gamma and retinoids were retained. And also EGF was regulated as uh, we initially described across these cohorts. And most convincingly, you can see that 99% of the genes were concordantly uh, regulated, meaning genes who were repressed in one cohort were repressed in the other transcripts who went up in one cohort went up. It's arguing critically both for us and for our pharma partners that three quarters of the pathways were activated early on, stay on throughout the disease process. So if you target them, which right now is the only path possible due to FDA regulations in later disease, and you see a frequency, there's a chance that these also will be active early on. A key finding in the study, uh, again, alerting us how uh, difficult it is to capture our disease processes is the time sequence. These are data over 21 years, which we have generated from this patient population. And here you can see renal biopsies were obtained between year four and five in these patients. This is measured GFR, so as exactly determined renal function as we can non invasively. And our gene expression modules, which are correlating with the degree of interstitial fibrosis, are depicted here. And you can see both the structural and the molecular uh, observations do not show any degree of associations with our functional measurements for the first decade. But in the second decade, we are starting to see very strong associations which go up to very high R square values, indicating that the early structural lesions and the molecular correlates are actually associated and we tested even predictive of the disease state of the patients two decades later. Arguing that indeed this is a very rich uh, area for biomarker development and also actually arguing that renal biopsies can be informative in the prognostic value uh, in this setting as well. So with this approach, we have now a landscape established that we have a lot of knowledge available to target both uh, uh, biomarker and drug development. I want to give you one example where we pushed it through to a phase two study that in the differently regulated data sets, you might have seen it, we saw the very robust inflammatory signature. And Celine Batty, together with Tripusius, mapped these into known pathways, and the check start pathways were shown both tubular and glomerular compartment to be activated in a stage specific manner. That was very intriguing because in parallel studies which we have done in our diabetes center, where we are profiling between eye, nerve, and kidney, and human and mouse studies, our model systems in the humans very comprehensively. We did a careful study of three different mouse models of diabetic kidney disease. They were actually prioritized by an NIDDK network. 
build our regulatory network similar to what we have been doing in humans out of the tissue level, and then ask where do these networks overlap with the human disease data set from our early diabetic kidney disease. And each data set has many, many different genes, but if you overlay them, very quickly identify the key drivers of the disease who are conserved between the human and the three different mouse models. And if we do a, a network analysis and ask what are the key regulatory hubs shared among the three mouse models and the humans, you can see that the Jack start pathway is coming up as a key driver of a glomerular data set of glomerular diabetic kidney disease features shared between mouse and mouse. Can we therefore measure the activity of this pathway in the tissue? Remember, transcript levels are measuring how much mRNA is present. They do not mean that a pathway is on or off. That obviously is very complex, regulated beyond transcript. But if you know how a pathway works, and we can build a network with our collaborators at Princeton who are specific for a specific pathway and a specific tissue, we can then use the downstream expression signatures, meaning the Jack start pathway is channeling via ligation of receptors, signaling of kinases, into transcription factors who are activate specific mRNAs if the regulatory cascade is on. And these specific mRNAs are known, and we could actually measure and test if they are found in our kidney tissue using both our data set, public knowledge, and transcriptional modeling. We can identify key regulators of the pathway on transcript level, and then ask how are they changing in our patients across many different diseases. And this is what you can see here. We generate a Jack start activation score out of 127 transcripts. You can see in healthy individuals, these are living donor biopsies from people who are donating a kidney to a relative or friend who have been tested very carefully to be renally healthy. These are supranormal controls. You can see we have a very low activation score of the pathway. And then in membranous, minimal change, IgA, hypertensive, diabetes, FSGS, uh, vasculitis and lupus scores goes consequently up. You also can see that this is a, quite a spread between the different patients, I think that we have significant disease heterogeneity present, not surprisingly. The finding, again, was that these non-inflammatory diseases, hypertension, diabetes, FSGS, have a significant activation of that inflammatory path. And that allows you to reconsider, can we flip over some of the compounds who are used for Jack start uh, inactivation in oncology or autoimmune diseases to these diseases. And we were very fortunate that our colleagues here in Indiana uh, have had an active research program for an oral Jack 2 inhibitor who is targeting rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. And we were able to convince them to consider repurposing of that inhibitor in diabetic kidney disease using a randomized clinical trial by Eli Lilly with the primary outcome of change of albumin to creatinine ratios after half a year of treatment. The exciting part is from the first discussion with Lilly to the completion of the phase two trial, it was only 42 months, not the usual 15 years of drug development. This really indicates that these repurposing strategies can be very effectively targeting uh, novel pathways uh, in a disease process if they have been validated in a parallel disease phase. And the trial reported out successfully just a few months ago. Uh, you can see that after three and six months, here in a dose-dependent manner, bartizitinib actually reduced the albumin to creatinine ratio significantly. The patients increased the albumin to creatinine ratio in the placebo group and showed the repression uh, after three and six months, and most importantly, even after months of washout where any acute hemodynamic effect will have disappeared, treatment still had a lasting effect on the albumin to creatinine ratio. I think that indeed in humans inhibiting that pathway can impact uh, the progressive state of diabetic kidney disease. Interestingly, we are able to convince Lily to follow the hypothesis of precision medicine throughout the entire study by actually testing some of the activation downstream biomarkers we predicted to be responsive to the Chuck start treatment in silico 
in the patient samples. And here I show you the urine parameters for IP10, CXCL10. We predict it to be one of the key downstream targets of the pathway. And you can see already after two weeks in a beautiful dose-dependent manner uh, repression of that inflammatory biomass. Establishing several critical aspects. A, the compound is active in the kidney against the inflammatory states. And that our modeling indeed was successful in predicting what the interrenal states are. And third, if you move forward with a therapeutic strategy like that, you can use that A in your clinical trial to select patients who are responding to your compound and drop those who are not responding, make them available for other additional trials. And in clinical care, you can monitor actually uh, efficacy and compliance of the treatment. This is one of the examples where we feel strongly that uh, the systems biology approach indeed can deliver novel therapeutic strategies to our patients. So the last 10 minutes, I want to give you a few snippets how we uh, envision to continue, enhance, and accelerate drug discovery for chronic kidney disease. And here we take advantage of the fact that over the last 20 years, we have used renal tissue but we have used it after microdissection, where we identify transcripts regulated in a glomerulus or in a tubular compartment, where you have four, five, six cells intermingled, and we are getting an expression signatures from these gemish of cells. With recent advantage in technologies, we now can actually profile the transcript of an individual cell comprehensively, and thereby can answer the question, what does a specific cell, a specific cell type do in a disease process, which allows us uh, to unleash the power of our bioinformatic modeling now on a cellular unit as a single observation state. And as part of the acceleration of medicine program, the rheumatoid arthritis and, and lupus nephritis and of the kidney precision medicine uh, project, we now have comprehensively mapped here state of the kidney in an individual transcript level per cell. So each dot on this plot, there are 32,000 dots on this plot, represents a cell which we have isolated from a human kidney and obtained the gene expression signatures of that cell. And then these cells are sorted according to similarity. So that cells who have the same type of expression patterns are grouped together in these uh, clusters. And then we go into the signatures from these cells and asking, what do they do? What transcripts are present in there? And as after a couple of decades doing that in work, we know pretty well what genes are hanging out in the kidney, can assign to each of these clusters what specific cells are present. And as you can see, we have here a collection of all of the cell types along the nephron, from different endothelial cells to glomerular cells to the tubular compartment. We have the interstitial compartment present. And even the inflammatory cells present in health and disease. And with these, we now can ask the question, many of the pathway I have shown you, in aggregate, where do they live, what do they do, can we identify distinct subtypes for targeting? So that's one key advantage we have available now. The other is that up to now, I've shown you the animal model data, and mice are different from man, and they do not reflect the genetic diversity we have in man. So what we have done over the last uh, couple of uh, years uh, that we have leveraged the development of the uh, stem cell field towards the kidney by being able to establish kidney organoids from stem cells who reflect a degree of differentiation of the key glomerular filter cells and the tubular cells in an unprecedented manner, which we never had in a standard 2D monoculture present before. The beauty is we can grow these organoids out of embryonic stem cells, but we also can grow them from induced pluripotent stem cells from iPSCs, which we have available now from 150 of our PIMA patient population or from two dozens of the Neptune population. So you can take these organoids in an individual specific manner and ask if I have a genetic variance present in a patient, how does this translate in activation? of the same single cell signatures I have shown you from the mature kidney. That's what we did. Took our organoids from uh, human-derived iPSCs and human fetal uh, kidney signatures and asked where do the fetal developmental kidney and the developing organ system 
overlap between the organoid and the human kidney development. And if we do that, we can match renal organogenesis uh, to renal development cell by cell and ask, do we find overlap between the different cell states? So here, for example, in the organoid cluster, we see a subgroup of cells who we, based on their transcript, they have protocin, they have nephrine, we assign to be protocytes of mature state. And if we go back to the developing human kidney single cell cluster, indeed, the signatures are tightly overlapping. You can show the same for uh, early protocytes, some of the endothelial cell features. In the tubular compartment, the overlap is there, but it's not as stringent, telling us that we are missing some features in this system. You can, just like with Princeton, we develop what's called trajectory analysis, meaning we take our individual cells, which we have present here, and we saw them how they change among each other in a continuous line so that we can rebuild the developmental trajectories. That you can see here, you get these different cells sorted according to similarity and how they get more and more different. And then you can, excuse me, and I'm missing one of the slides here, I'm sorry. And then you can actually assign them to specific states. So this developmental trajectory here are actually the protocytes. You can see that the organoids is pushing out in the development to a fair degree of development, but not all the way down to what we see in a filtering glomerulus. Or here you have the tubular compartment, proximal tubular cells there. It allows you to benchmark your ex vivo system exactly uh, to the human state, so that if you manipulate these organoids, you know where you are manipulating a process which is recapitulating the human disease and which. And with this strategy, we can actually now map out where the uh, developmental states is going over time here for different protocyte-specific molecules, the filter cells and the kidney. And we can even assign where specific transcription factors are activated, turned on and turned off in the process, delivering novel therapeutic targets in that context. If you look at the different states, these are the early protocytes and the late protocytes, you can see that uh, the late differentiated protocytes if anything, are lost in chronic kidney disease, whereas the early protocyte migas, they come up when the kidney filter is damaged, giving us a first glimpse what molecular pathways the cell has available to respond to damage which it borrows from its own development. And one of the molecules we are pursuing right now is the serine protease, which is eminently therapeutically targeted, and there are molecules available to do that. But you can see that that serine protease is highly activated in chronic kidney disease, correlated stringently with loss of kidney function. It's activated in nephrotic syndromes and not so much in uh, subnephrotic syndrome in our lupus patients. And if we stain for the molecule in a glomerulus, in healthy glomeruli, you can see it's expressed only in the Bowman's capsule here and here. But in diabetic kidney disease, it actually is re-expressed in the protocyte, changing them to a more micro migratory active phenotype and probably loss of the protocyte from the glomerular filter, which we are actively pursuing right now. This was a series of studies which I tried to present uh, this morning to give you an area where we are identifying biomarkers, uh, we are identifying and pursuing opportunities for repurposing, and where there are ways to identify novel disease cellular states in our disease processes in a patient-specific manner. However, as I mentioned at my introductory comment, this is a research effort where we are building research infrastructure opportunity knowledge for you to utilize. This really is critical for these activities because obviously each scientist has a very unique window into the disease processes she or he is interrogating and making these data sets available to the community is a critical task at hand. So this is what Francis Collins and uh, Barack Obama in the precision medicine strategy referred to as the informational commons, that we have this knowledge network, but it's somewhere accessible to the community. This has been close to our heart for the last 15 years, that we developed systematically tools and approaches for non-experts in informatics and computational medicine to gain access to the information for the clinician scientists and the molecular biologists. 
one of the tools we have in the field now for 12 years is NeftwoSeq. It's a disease-specific tool who allows you to interrogate a specific molecule of interest to you across all the human expression data sets who are out in the public domain and have been shared with us. You, it's free for the academic community. We collect the data, we standardize them, we have pre-analyzed them, we have visualized them. And you can go in there and you can type in your molecule of interest, your pathway of interest, your disease states of interest, and we will return to you uh, in a second uh, what the molecule are the diseases your molecule is differentially regulated, disease stages of differential regulation, or conversely, if you are interested in you know rapidly progressive vasculitis, we tell you which gene sets, which pathways are activated in their disease. It's very easy entry level uh, type of introductory uh, tutorials in there. If you're interested in some of these molecules, even if you're not a nephrologist, it might be helpful to teach you where these molecules are changing. Second strategy for our research network is that we use an open uh, source, open data community tool called Transmart to actually aggregate a lot of our data come from our multi-scalar data system into one single place and then have overlaid an interface so that a researcher investigator with simple drag and drop functions can define the cohort you are interested in. I'm interested in patients with diabetes who have early stage uh, glomerulopathy with microalbuminuria and are on ACE inhibitors. What is a gene set which is activated in these patients versus those who are not on ACE inhibitors? And you pull that over, you pop it in, we will return to you the molecular information or the histological information or the kaplan meyer survival curve. And this is linked to uh, the rare disease network with the European cohort study. Our colleagues in China have an independent instance which they operate independently from us, uh, have their own governance, but they use the same platform, the same data. So with a click of a mouse, you can compare the data sets across these different units. The uh, QGN uh, glomerular disease network is doing the same and in public-private partnership with companies. We are also utilizing that information so that we can bring them forward as quickly as possible in the drug developmental process. So with this, I would like to wrap up. I hope I have given you an overview how uh, we can link our comprehensive information which we have uh, accumulated with target and biomarker development going forward and then having starting point for validation in model systems, animal models, and I think very interestingly, the organoids and individual level patients to identify relevant subgroup for targeted treatment development. And with this, I really would like to thank all the investigators, the clinician scientists, study coordinators who made these cohort studies possible, the team in Michigan who actually makes it fun to do this type of work, but most of all our patients really committed in many instances, years, sometimes decades of their life uh, to support our research study so that hopefully we can impact the life of their children or themselves with our findings. Thanks a lot for your attention.
think, obviously, uh, considering, and I think the Lothar study from Rob Nelson indicated that, you know, very early aggressive management of any of the emerging risk factors is critical. So if your patient even trends to become hypertensive, considering a RAS inhibiting agent to be deployed, I think is critical. And yes, continue very careful monitoring of the albuminuria, and we hope to have sensitive biomarkers being qualified by the FDA. Urinary EGF is going through that process right now, so that you can add, in addition to albuminuria and uh, GFR measurements, more specific biomarkers. The most important part, however, is we have a multitude of clinical trials active in the field right now. In diabetic kidney disease, in FSGS, please consider to participate in these trials. It's very exciting for us nephrologists to finally have an opportunity to test some of the novel drugs in our patients. But as we had so few clinical trials over the last two decades, we have a lot of problems to recruit patients into trial. And there's a real danger right now with all that knowledge, all the excitement, all the opportunity and investment. If we cannot bring patients to trials, this all will be in vain. That is one, I think, of the main reasons. If you have diabetic patients, the diabetic kidney disease patients, please check back with your nephrology team which clinical trials are active for DKD. If you have other diseases like lupus, uh, you know, which clinical trials are active in that domain. Because that's really, for the next two, three years, a critical time window for us. If we can recruit into these trials, I'm confident that some, not all, but some of them will be successful. And that will generate a dynamic uh, that uh, we really can change the way we practice medicine uh, in the near future. Absolutely. No, this is uh, our data. Actually, if you, we have a lot of cross organ, which I didn't present today, cross organ studies in place. And the way a differentiated epithelial cell organ responds to a challenge uses similar mechanisms across kidney, liver, and bowel, not surprisingly. And intervia, intervening there early and often is critical. But if you actually is a CHAC1, CHAC2 inhibitor, if you look at the data carefully, it was sold by a CHAC, but it's a dual dual inhibitor. And the main purpose for the presentation of the Native Americans, the Pima population, was to get exactly that message across, that we have to consider to treat early and often. Uh, in kidney disease, the regulatory path for drug approval requires that you impact GFR loss 40-50% of uh, beneficial effect of your treatment which allows you only to be active in late stage disease. So our trials have to live in CKD three stages. But my prediction is, and that's why we spend so much time and energy to show that the mechanisms are conserved, that if you find efficacy at later disease, there is a good rationale to go to early disease. And we're working very actively with regulators, both FDA and EMA, in a large European public-private partnership network finally get biomarkers qualified for clinical trials, which we can use in early, particularly diabetic kidney disease. But that will take several more years of effort to be fit. Yes, so I call it chronic 
inflammatory fibrotic pathways. And that's where these uh, signals are living. We are losing differentiated organ function that was among the metabolic signals. That's a lot of the underlying aspects there is that you're losing epithelial cell differentiation and you're flipping over to a more mesenchymal inflammatory state. You have to use one heading or the other. The beauty is, you know, we have now highly granular data where you don't have to, if you do your research, talk in these broad strokes any longer, but you really can dive in and you can dissect the crosstalk, which is happening there. And, you know, EGF clearly is living in that corner very well, but it is a known upstream regulator of a lot of the downstream inflammatory responses who goes via epithelial cell de-differentiation and regenerative capacity, absolutely. Oh. Wow, that is great. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, get the wire out of.